Well, God spoke to us uh, rather bluntly last week in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 7. It's kind of a bracing thing at the end of the Sermon on the Mount after giving all of the ways in which the new covenant would play out. Jesus goes through a series of people and say they name themselves as people of faith, but they put their faith in their tribe and in their religion. These are people of faith, but they put their trust in something else. And he finally gives that very bracing statement that not all who call him Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven. And he gives the picture of the wide, comfortable road and the big gate and then the narrow, difficult road that leads to the narrow gate as the entrance to heaven. He is giving a preview of the division that will occur at the end of history. He speaks explicitly about this in Matthew chapter 25 when he describes the sheep and the goats, when he describes that awful moment where Jesus, as the sole judge of belief and faith, where Jesus, as the only judge, will confront each person as they come forward and say, you're going this way, you're going this way. And when you think about that, we tend to think in herds that whole groups of us will move together because after all, we've worshiped together. After all, we've spent years and years of our lives together. So surely Jesus will wave us all together as a group. But the Bible tells us differently. The Bible tells us that each one of us has to stand before the judge And he's not going to evaluate us on our behavior. He is not going to evaluate us on any kind of worldly success, on the amount of treasure that we, on any of those things. The one thing that scripture is absolutely clear about that Jesus will judge each person on, and that is their faith, their belief. There is no other thing by which he will evaluate who goes to his left and who goes to his right. That would be disheartening, that statement, if we combine those two things together. That could cause us to lose hope. It could cause our shalom to be stripped away from us. We would have no peace, no joy. We would not feel love. We would feel as though we were lost which is the reality for us, that that we are lost. But the reality is that we've been found. And Jesus and his word have made absolutely clear what is required of faith. There are things, there are just two parts to what Jesus is going to evaluate in our faith. Number one, we must be repentant for sin, and that is not we are sorry for sin in the aftermath of having done it. It is, that is not repentance. Repentance is the intentional turning away from sin. So that is one half of the measure, and the second half of the measure is that we believe in the one that God has sent. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that his death on that cross atoned for sin, that his resurrection demonstrated that he had overcome death, that he had overcome the power of sin, and that he alone, he alone could be the one who sets people free. That's what faith is. That's what the Bible says that faith is all about. It's so simple, and yet it seems to be so difficult. It seems to be so hard for people. It's hard because the church has made it easy. Now, it may sound like I said that wrong, but let me say it again. It is hard to be repentant. It is hard to place all your faith in the finished work of Christ because the church, the modern church through the centuries has gone out of its way to make it easy to be named as a person of faith. 
We've made it so simple. We have taken faith and turned it into nothing more than intellectual agreement with the idea of Jesus. Yes, Jesus is an awesome guy. Two thumbs up. Therefore, I name myself as a Christian. And the belief sits up here in our head. And it, and it governs some of our behaviors and we justify away others. It deals with some of our choices and, and on and on and on. This is the faith where we raise our hand. This is the faith where we walked down an aisle at some point in our life. This is a, a faith where, where we, we prayed the magic prayer at some point and then it ended. We did those things, one of those things, maybe all of those things, we do that and then we just drift back into our lives. We just go back to our lives somehow confident that we are in Christ, somehow assured that heaven is our eternal destination because I did this, or I did this, or I did this. One of those things. We discover as we open God's word and go through the pages here that that's completely contrary to what the Bible says. The Bible gives no magical prayer. The Bible gives no simple assent by the raising of your hand. The Bible never talks about walking an aisle, having some sort of salvific effect. The Bible doesn't do any of those things. The Bible calls us instead to examine ourselves. The Bible commands that we should be intent about looking into our lives, about examining where our faith lies, examining whether we are repentant, whether we actually believe that Jesus is who he says he, does, he is. And this too, the church turns that into an individual exercise. Like, all of you just go home now and examine yourselves. Well, I tell you what, we are all, every single one of us here, the best Christians ever when we are all by ourselves. Isn't this a fact? When we are by ourselves examining ourselves, we can convince ourselves that we are truly wonderful. That fruit just drips off of our, you have to picture branches here, that fruit just falls off of us. You see, the Bible says, don't be deceived. The Bible says, yeah, examine yourself and then have others examine your life as well. That's the purpose for fellowship. That is the purpose for Jesus forming the church. So that we will not fall into self-deceit. We will not wander off by ourselves and convince ourselves that we are wonderful and perfectly in Jesus' grace. No, he says you're going to gather together. And your fruit, the fruit that you say you have should be evident to all people. Everybody in your group should be able to see the fruit that you have. And if you've examined yourself and you've convinced yourself that you have fruit, well, everybody else should be able to see it. And if nobody else can see it, you need to go back to step one and re-examine yourself and your faith. You see, we are, not ex we, are, we are not assured, we are not given hope by our thoughts up here. That's a part of the modern belief system. We are assured by the Holy Spirit within us. We are given the hope that we have by the Holy Spirit being the anchor that holds our life in place. And... And we are assured by the Holy Spirit in other people around us affirming who we think we are. We have other people around us bearing the Holy Spirit able to examine and evaluate the fruit in our life. So I guess that brings up the next question. What does this look like? What does the fruit in our life look like? What would it look like if we were actually believers, those that Jesus would welcome home rather than turn away? And since the Spirit comes into us and does not give us like angel wings and halos, we have to look at other things that are a part of our reality. And that's what's called in the Bible the fruit of the Spirit, those things that our character will transform transform into, those things that are unnatural to you and I that will become a natural part of who you and I are, not only that we can see, but that everybody can see. 
The Bible warns about this. He gives us the fruit. He gives us the idea of the fruit of the Spirit. You can list them off. You've all heard that verse. But then James says something important. He says, you can't have faith without deeds. See, he's dividing it again. James is saying in in chapter 2, you cannot have faith without those deeds. If you have faith without this fruit, that's what he's referring to, not some kind of action. He says, if you have this, this belief that you are saved and there is absolutely no fruit of the Spirit in your life, you need to go back and re-examine where you stand. You need to go back and find out why that's true. Because the Bible says of every believer, of every single believer, that you will bear fruit. Now, some will be very small fruit. Some will be barely edible fruit. Some of you will blossom and and provide so much fruit that it just covers the ground. But you will bear some type of fruit. And it will be affirmed by other people around you. Other people who also bear the Holy Spirit within them. And that's why James confronts that. He's dealing with people whose faith had gone into their head and their behaviors did not follow what they said that they were. He says, faith without works, the very end of this passage, it's dead. It's dead, it cannot save. It will not save. You will be the person, I'm adding this to James, but this is what he meant. You will be that person that arrives home to be judged And Jesus will say, I never, never knew you. So how can we have assurance that you and I all have this true faith? How you and I can be assured of this thing? We do it by examining ourselves, but also participating in the examination of other, in affirming in others the transformation that we see, in affirming in others and, and, and sharing with them and telling them the fruit that we're seeing in their lives. And also, if we're not seeing any fruit in someone's life, also if we're not seeing any transformation in someone's life, also if we can see that their faith rests in their head but has never settled into their soul. In each of those cases that we follow the Holy Spirit's leading to come alongside those people and talk to them and tell them that we're not seeing the fruit that would be promised, that we're not seeing the transformation that the Holy Spirit wants to work in the life of a true believer. You know, the disciples, the apostles, knew this feedback loop better than anyone else. Think about that. They lived all those years with Jesus. And Jesus was not maybe the most patient teacher. He would give them the power, the authority. He would give them the knowledge necessary to perform their ministry, to go out and expand the kingdom. And then he would send them out without any practice, without any backup, without anything. He just go out and minister. And what happens to them? Sometimes they're very good at what they do. Sometimes they go out and they have this amazing effect. And other times they come back and they're puzzled. Jesus, why couldn't we drive this demon out? Why couldn't we heal this? Why couldn't we accomplish this? And so they get that immediate feedback from Jesus. He says, you didn't believe, you didn't believe, you didn't believe, you didn't believe. I gave you the authority, I gave you the power, I gave you the mission, I sent you out. All you had to do was believe that I, the divine son of God, had given you everything that you needed. That's all you had to do. But they get into the world and they find out it's not as easy as they thought it would be. That there are more challenges out there than they expected. No one more so than Peter. Golly, Peter, man, he is, he is our whipping boy, isn't he? Peter gets ahead of himself um, every time, basically. Peter runs ahead of his mouth and his brain uh, more times than we can count. 
Poor Peter. He loves Jesus. He wants to be Jesus' number one apostle. He wants to be the model of, of faith. And yet Peter gets so far ahead of the Lord that he trips over himself. No more so than at the cross. Right? Didn't he tell Jesus? Didn't he look Jesus in the eye and said, I will never, never leave you. I will never forsake you. And Jesus said, you're not just going to leave me once. You're not going to just deny me a single time. You're going to do it three times. And of course, Peter does. Peter fails spectacularly. But what does Jesus do? Jesus gives him that feedback loop. He says, do you love me? In other words, do you believe in me? What does Peter say? You know I do. Jesus ratchets it up a little bit. Do you love me? I mean, do you really love me? Peter says, you know I do. You know I do. And it's, and it's sinking down to here now. This examination loop is really sinking in here. And you would have thought after the second time that Jesus would have cut him a little slack, but he asked him a third time, do you love me? Do you love me? Who I am, what I am, what I'm going to do. Do you love me? Peter says, I do. I do, Lord. That's that examination loop that Peter gets in with Jesus himself. And it's the same examination loop that you and I are to be a part of. One of the great legacies of Peter's ministry is not just that fantastic moment at Pentecost and all of the things in, in, in establishing the church after that, but there are two books towards the back of the New Testament that Peter authors, and they are both books of incredible holiness. They spell out from start to finish what holiness looks like. And when we read Peter, we keep in mind that Peter is not Paul at all. That's very alliterative. There, he is not Paul in any way. Paul, we, we never see Paul fail, right? Paul is just, he's perfect day after, he drives you nuts. He is just perfect time after time. But here we have somebody we can really identify with in Peter. We really have somebody who we can listen to when he says, this is the path to holiness. Turn with me in your Bible to 2 Peter, to the second letter that he writes. He's going to talk about the self-examination, the necessity of looking into our lives, and he's going to give us not only the command to evaluate our faith, but what our faith would look like. I'm going to do this kind of backwards. I'm going to go down to chapter 1, and I'm going to start in verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So there's the direct connection between what we saw in Matthew last week and how we can be assured that we will be people known to the Lord Jesus. So he gives us this call. He begins with therefore. Anytime we see therefore in scripture, we have to look behind that. We have to say he's answering something. He's addressing what he just said. So he's saying in light of all the things I have just said to you, examine yourselves. And this is not a suggestion. This is not maybe 10 ways to into discipleship. This is a command. Examine yourselves. You must do this. And what he's laying out for us here is that Jesus himself, through this spirit, has given us everything that we need to be marked out as holy, to be made holy, to be transformed 
in our character into a person of holiness. He's laid all this out. Therefore, look at the loop here. Therefore, if you examine yourself, you should be able to see these things happening in your life. You should be able to evaluate yourself whether or not you are becoming more and more Christ-like or more and more holy. That's the purpose of this little loop that he's going on. So the question that we start there then is, how do I know that the Holy Spirit dwells within me? That's where we have to start because it's the Spirit that is going to guide our understanding of holiness. If we are people of just faith in the head, we have no hope of understanding holiness because what will we do? We'll do what we always do, and that is we will make up our own version of holiness. And I know you're shaking your head, no, pastor, that never happens. No, no, no one has ever done that. We're famous for doing that. A person cannot be a Christian without the Holy Spirit. So that's where it begins. In one that the Holy Spirit dwells is a Christian. One in whom the Holy Spirit has never visited is not a person of faith is not a Christian. And here, now watch, this sounds like double talk, but follow along with me. The person of faith or a a faith or a belief that never questions the presence or the work or the transformation of the Holy Spirit, that's a good indication. Watch this now. That's a good indication that that faith is stuck up in their head. I'll repeat that again. If a faith that you have, that I have, that someone has, if that faith never stops and questions the presence of the Holy Spirit, in other words, how is the Spirit working in me? What is the Spirit transforming in me? In what way do I need to be changed further by the Holy Spirit? If you never ask that, there's a good chance that the Holy Spirit is not within you because that's the first job of the Holy Spirit is to bring you back to repentance, to bring you back to a reminder that it is by grace that you have been saved. It was not by your efforts, not by your works, not by anything that you did up and down the aisle or raising your hand or or saying some magic prayer. None of that. You were saved by faith. And in faith, the Holy Spirit comes and indwells you. Now, that's the indicator of the negative. The positive indicator is if in your life there is a concern, an interest, not, not a worry, not anything like that, but an interest in what the Holy Spirit is doing and what he's saying to you in the areas where he's showing you. Maybe you're coming up a little bit short. Then that's an excellent indicator that the Holy Spirit is at work within you and that you will begin to bear fruit as long as you are patient with the way that he's working in you. The Holy Spirit's job is to make us holy er. We are already holy. Holy simply means set apart. Holy simply means that we have been separated from the world. So to become holier means to become set apart a bull er something like that. More and more set apart. That's the purpose of the Holy Spirit and that's the first fruit that you and I will see in our lives. If that, if the presence of the Spirit, that gift of faith that we get is one side of the coin, the other side of this coin is the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit of what that Holy Spirit is doing in us. And that's what Peter had explained before he got to those two verses there. You go back up, we could go all the way up to verse 3, but we'll kind of walk through this. He, he talks about divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who, who called us by his own glory and goodness. In other words, you have been set apart by the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and you have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit. So our question is, what does that mean? look like 
He says, you will work out your salvation in this way. Run down to verse five. For this reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control and to self-control perseverance and to perseverance godliness and to godliness mutual affection and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we were confronted by that bracing statement last week that on the final judgment day, some will appear before the judge, before the Lord Jesus, and some who will claim to have been his followers all their days, Jesus will turn to them and say, I never knew you. This is the answer to that. How can I know that Jesus knows me? If Jesus knows you, his Holy Spirit dwells within you. If his Holy Spirit is dwelling within you, number one, you will be concerned for your increasing holiness. You will be interested in being more and more set apart from the world and you will see this fruit in your life. We often read this little passage here from five and on as though one leads to the next and then that leads to the next. So I'll work first on my, uh, what, my goodness. And once I get my goodness uh, uh, squared away, then I'll, then I'll work a little bit on my knowledge. I mean, no, no, that's not what Peter's saying. Peter's saying all of these things together increase because every one of them is a part of every other part of this. Faith and goodness and knowledge and self-control and perseverance and godliness and mutual affection, that's our love for one another and love. All of these things move together. All of these things are how we evaluate one another's faith. All of these things are marks that we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit and that we are known to Jesus Christ. And that's our second test. It's this growing holiness, this growing set-apartness that is a work only of the Holy Spirit in each of our lives. Peter says all these things grow together. These aren't projects that we engage in. These are the marks of holiness. And the more that you become holy, the more that you become set apart, the more these things will be evident in your life. And so we ask how, how, how can I evaluate this? Well, you look at that list of things there and you ask yourself these questions. In my life, in my life and others, can they affirm this? Do I have a growing desire for worship? Do I have a growing desire to be present consistently together with these people and worship? Do I spend more and more time in prayer because I absolutely believe that God is going to work through that prayer? Do I hunger for a deeper knowledge of God's word, not just being able to memorize some verses, but actually what God is speaking through his holy word? Do I have a deeper desire for that? Do, do I have a growing desire for greater fellowship with other Christians? Do I have a desire to be of greater service in the kingdom of God? That's our assurance. If those things are true of us, if we have a longing to worship with our brothers and sisters, if we have a longing to, to examine the word of God together, to hear God speak individually and corporately, these are marks that the Spirit is at work in us because these are the things that set us apart, that make us holy. If there's a good thing, then there is a bad thing as well. The other side of that is really the opposite of all those statements. If you find yourself not the least bit interested in the things of God, not interested in worship 
not willing to devote yourself to prayer, not really interested beyond just memorizing the words of God's Bible. If any of those things are true of you, those are the opposite of the marks of holiness. Those are the marks of us being more concerned with us. Those are the marks of us creating an idol named Warren or Bob. Those are the marks of us arriving before the judge and getting separated in a direction that we weren't expecting. If the Spirit has truly indwelt us, we will be devoted to the assurance that that gives us. And because we are human beings, we look for experiential things. We don't need any kind of magical occurrence. We simply look for a greater and a deeper holiness in our lives. And that's the mark of one who is known to the Savior Jesus. Peter makes an incredibly bold statement a couple of chapters later in the third chapter of 2 Peter. It's a verse you've heard before. He says that God is patient. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. We've gone in full circle now, haven't we? That's your mark. That the will of God, of one who truly has faith, is to be repentant, to have turned away from sin, to seek out a greater holiness, to be more set apart from the world. And the second mark is that the Holy Spirit will come and indwell them. And the Holy Spirit will absolutely convince us that Jesus on the cross not only atoned for all sin, but that he overcame death. He overcame the power of sin in our life, that we are truly set free and that we can break from the things that tempt us in this world and we can be a part of this greater and greater and greater holiness. The gospel of Jesus Christ, that thing that we sang about over and over this morning is so simple. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that he took your place. That's the good news. It seems rather gruesome, but the good news of Jesus Christ is not, hey, I'm going to give you a magic ticket to heaven. The good news of Jesus Christ absolutely has nothing to do with going to heaven. It has to do with the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, took your place on the cross and paid the penalty for your sin. Your, insert your name here, sin. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. And not only did he pay the penalty, he perished so that you don't have to. So that as Peter says, God doesn't want anyone to perish. That's the good news of the gospel. That is the whole of the gospel message. The good news is not about going to heaven. It is so much greater than what we've turned it into. That Jesus took your place, that he took your penalty, that, that, that he died so that you could live, that is so far removed from getting the golden ticket to heaven. It's so distant from that. The gospel that Christ took your place, perished so you don't have to, is about the reconnection of relationship. Remember how the relationship between God and man is broken in the garden. That thing that causes all of the problems that we know. When Jesus dies, the gospel message, the good news is that because Jesus did that, because he pushed sin 
away because he made it non-existent, that we would not suffer the penalty for it, that Jesus did that allows us to be reconnected to our creator, to the God of the universe, to the one who makes us who we are intended to be. Our response to the gospel message is a love for Jesus Christ who did this for us. Through his love, through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we realize how lost we were. We realize how hopeless we were. We realize how much of our shalom had been stripped away. We come to know in here all of these things. And then we are assured that all of this has been restored to us. Our hope, our peace, the joy that we were intended to have, our ability to love one another, all of those things have been restored back because of what Jesus did for us. The gospel is a call to repentance. The good news is a call to turn away from the world, to turn away from sin, to leave this world behind, to leave the things of this world behind, to not get distracted by all the things that are shiny and glittering in this world, by, by not constantly looking at all the options that the world offers for us, and to be mindful of what Jesus Christ did for you. That he died for you to set you apart. That he died for you to set you free. That he died for you so that you can be reconnected to your creator. That's the good news. That is the gospel message proclaimed in the sacrifice of Christ. I ask you, I implore you, I, I, I beg you to know this gospel. Not just know this gospel, but to know this gospel. If this is foreign to you, if this sounds like something you've never heard before, accept this gospel invitation. Accept the free gift that God has extended out to all people. God is patient, not wanting anyone to perish. And he offers the solution. Be transformed. Be set apart. Be what you were made and intended to be. Amen?